The first speaker we have tonight is number one. Up. Hello, my name is Dennis Higgins, D-E-N-I-S-H-I-G-G-I-N-S. It's FERC's mission to consider public convenience and necessity. FERC must ensure energy supplies are sufficient and consider pricing. Here's the public convenience and necessity part of Northeast Energy Direct. Kinder Morgan wants to move its gas. We here in New York don't need it. Massachusetts has already said they don't want it. Nearly 50 town resolutions have been passed opposing NED. Where is the gas going? We can connect the dots. Kinder Morgan's gas is headed for a proposed LNG terminal in Nova Scotia. With FERC approval, Kinder Morgan will be able to seize New Yorkers land, bulldoze our forests, trash our rivers, and export their gas to, to China. This project's sole aim is to make money for Kinder Morgan, and New Yorkers and New Englanders will suffer the health and environmental costs. There is no public convenience or necessity here. Awarding this permit violates your mission. And here's a lesson in supply and demand. When the gas gets to Canada for export, our prices for gas go up. Like others here, I want to talk about jobs. I personally would not want a temporary job if it meant a, la a neighbor had to lose his land to eminent domain. I want to talk about FERC jobs too. I spoke with Dave Hanovic in your Office of Energy Products. Dave prepares an a, a statement, he called it a NEPA document, which is meant to disclose the environmental impacts of a proposal. But something is really wrong here. Either Dave isn't writing up a proper EIS, or you guys aren't reading it. Look what happened with the Constitution Pipeline in 2012, where thousands of people told you about the environmental harms, but you approved an un unnecessary pipeline to the company with the worst environmental record in Pennsylvania, and approved construction along the worst possible route. For its part, Kinder Morgan has been fined by the U.S. government for stealing coal from customer stockpiles, lying to air pollution regulators, and mixing hazardous waste into gasoline. Kinder Morgan doesn't bother with maintenance, and their pipelines are plagued by leaks and explosions, including two large spills in residential neighborhoods of British Columbia. Of course, you guys, the, that's the FERC itself, have been found guilty in federal court of violating the National Environmental Policy Act by allowing project segmentation as a way of avoiding cumulative impact analysis. FERC is accused of using illegal stalling tactics to keep lawsuits out of the courts while projects get built. Someone definitely ought to lose their job. Is it you guys, the commissioners, or Dave? Everyone in this room knows what's gonna happen. FERC salaries are paid by the oil and gas companies, and your environmental contractors are paid by gas companies. You approve every fracked gas project that's proposed. But we in New York want you to know something, and you're gonna hear the same thing in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Tennessee Gas Pipeline's NED project is not going to happen here. Uh, Dick Downey, Unitigo Area Land Owners Association. Uh, half the homes in the U.S. heat with gas. That's over 100 million homes. 54% of New England buildings are heated with gas. Electric generation is switching from coal to gas. It's 31% today and growing. In New England, 52% of the electricity comes from gas. Expect that to increase as nuclear plants age out. Because of the switch from coal to gas, carbon dioxide has been reduced in the United States to the lowest levels in 20 years, down to 1994 levels. All this with a growing population and a growing GDP. CNG cars and trucks, truck fleets are on the rise. This option cuts automobile mileage in half and emits 30% less CO2 than gasoline. Manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Costs of production and costs of feedstock are lower here. 24 LNG terminals are in the planning or construction phase. Once built, gas from the United States will offset Putin's chokehold on Europe. U.S. gas will reduce the use of coal in the Far East. 
New England pays a premium for natural gas. Last year, over $5 an MCF. Currently, New England gas comes from Canada and the Gulf Coast. Marcellus Gas sells at less than half that price and comes from a field only a few hundred miles away. All these factors, plus the cost and convenience of natural gas, creates a demand. Meeting that demand depends upon a delivery system. Kinder Morgan's Northeast Energy Direct Pipeline is part of that delivery system. Let's build it. The sooner the better. Better for our homes, businesses, factories, and quality of life. Better for our local, state, and national government. And better for the world. Let's get this pipeline built now. Thank you. My name is Eugene Marner, and I live in Franklin, New York. <clears throat> you, FERC, are required by law under the National Environmental Policy Act to consider cumulative impacts of projects reviewed by you. During the scoping hearings for the misnamed Constitution Pipeline, and during the hearings on the draft environmental impact statement for that same pipeline, you were repeatedly called upon to consider such cumulative impacts. Many commenters observed that the construction of an open access pipeline through the Marcellus and Utica Shales region of New York could lead to hydrofracking in New York State. That threat has been temporarily blocked by the Cuomo administration, but a future administration could easily alter that decision. Your final EIS did not examine the potential impact of a fracking build out that could accompany the Constitution pipeline. Furthermore, you were warned that permitting one massive industrial project like the Constitution Pipeline would change the rural agricultural region traversed by the pipeline from a greenfields area to an already industrialized one. No sooner have you approved the first pipeline than Tennessee Gas Pipeline has come along to propose another to run parallel to the first. Tennessee Gas Pipeline has also pr pr proposed a 30,000 horsepower compressor station for the town of Franklin a compressor station that will spew carcinogenic pollutants into the air breathed by citizens of Franklin, Otego, and Oneonta, and wherever else the wind carries them. Just yesterday, Medical Daily reported a 27% increase in hospitalizations for cardiac and neuro neurological condi conditions in Pennsylvania counties with large numbers of fracked wells, as well as increases in urological conditions, cancer, and skin ailments. FERC must revisit the conditional permit given to Constitution Pipeline and study the potential for health and environmental impacts of the expansion of gas extraction activities that will inevitably result from in infrastructure expansion. The evidence for that expansion is here today before us as you consider yet another application for another pipeline. The companies that want to build these pipelines boast on their websites that the gas will be sent to Canada for export. How does that serve the public convenience and necessity of the citizens of New York and the United States? Will making a few more Texans and their shareholders rich compensate for the loss of our clean air, water, and soil, along with the agriculture and tourism that comprise our economy? I don't think so. Reject Tennessee Gas Company's proposal and revisit your ill-considered approval of Constitution Pipeline. Do your job. Respond to the substantive comments and issues raised at these hearings. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I want to remind speakers when they come up to not only say their name out loud, but also to spell it for the court reporter. This should be speaker number four. And five. And five. My name is Stuart Anderson, S-T-U-A-R-T-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E and I'm Joan Tuberty, T-U-B-R-I-D-Y. We want to talk about the proposed compressor station in Franklin. We've heard lots of discussion in our communities, some of it very heated, about what the compressor station will mean for our area, and we'd like to sum it up for you. As we have just six minutes, we'll be quick about it. Joan will repeat the pro-pipeline pro arguments that we've heard. And Stu will offer the rebuttals, so here we go. The Franklin compressor station will be over a, half a, a mile and a half from the Otigo Elementary School. The train is much closer and much dirtier. 
The train goes through in just a couple of minutes, but the compressor station will follow the air around the clock. A mile and a half is not far enough to be safe from air pollution when the predominant winds, according to NYSERDA, blow right from the compressor site to the village of Otigo and the school. Yeah, but the EPA sets pollution limits. <laughs> but the Halliburton loophole exempts gas facilities from the Clean Air Act. Where there are limits, the operators ignore them with the excuse that venting is an emergency procedure. The most imminent danger may be in these short-term three or four hour spikes as venting occurs. But compressor stations use filters. The air leaving is cleaner than the air going in. <laughs> The tobacco industry told us that smoking was safe. How many millions of people died while the long-term studies were being done to prove that they were lying? Now the gas companies would have you believe that air pollution from compressor stations is safe. Will your kids be a statistic? Noise abatement measures are effective. Very true. But the problem is not about noise, it's about air pollution. Well, the compressor station is in Franklin, so this is Franklin's problem. The whole region will get the air pollution, so it is a problem for Otigo and Oneonta and Meredith residents as well. But the pipeline and compressor station will bring jobs. <laughs> Kinder Morgan confirms that. They say that the compressor station will employ two people. Other than temporary construction jobs, the pipeline will bring no jobs to our area. If you want long-term jobs, support the development of wind and solar and geothermal renewable resources. But we already have pipelines in our area. Yes, we do. Little eight-inch lines that do not have compressor stations in our vicinity. The small pipeline blast in 1990 in Blenheim killed two, injured five, and left 40 residents homeless. But it's just one compressor station in the middle of nowhere, Stu. <laughs> the net is piggybacking on Constitution, which does not yet have a compressor station in its 124-mile run. When they decide to install one, the easiest place will be right alongside the Kinder Morgan facility in Franklin. This project segmentation scheme was used on the Millennium Pipeline, laying the pipe first and then siting the compressors. But the compressor station will not run all the time. The pipeline companies are not spending hundreds of millions of dollars on these things to just sit there. Especially after the export terminals get up and pumping, these things will only shut down for maintenance. Which is probably worse, because that's when they're venting raw gas. Our children are moving away because there are no jobs here. The pipeline will bring no permanent jobs to the region, and the compressor station will scare away young families and our region's most financially desirable immigrants, retiring downstate professionals who love our safe, rural environment. There are many vocal citizens in favor of gas development in our area. Many well-intentioned people have been fooled by promises of jobs and an economic boom. Go visit Dimmick. It's the same depressed place it was 10 years ago. But remember to take a water bottle with you. The pipeline companies have been very supportive of our schools and our fire departments and EMS services. The gas companies have come through our region trying to buy people's loyalty by throwing around gifts. But they won't add up to anything like the cost of the damages they'll bring to our property values around and the property values in Hancock, for example, have been down by as much as 50%. But gas turbines burn very cleanly. I've seen this on television. I've seen a lot on television. But they still emit formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, and many other volatile organic compounds, plus radioactive radon and lead and polonium particulates that are common in Marcellus shale gas from Pennsylvania. Many of these disastrous chemicals are linked to childhood leukemia. Remember the Halliburton loophole. Gas facilities are unregulated air pollution sources. We have visited compressor stations and found nothing to fear. You can't see the air pollution. It is invisible. You can't smell the raw gas. It has not been scented yet. The workers on the site are all paid by the gas companies. Do you think they would risk their jobs by telling the whole truth? This is a FERC issue, a Franklin issue, a state issue, so re really we can do nothing about it. 
If you believe you are powerless, then you are powerless. But you can urge FERC to deny the Kinder Morgan that application. If you have no faith in FERC, urge your local officials to send a letter to the DEC and the governor supporting a gas infrastructure moratorium. Thank you for t your attention. And other than having a little fun here tonight, um, I have to say this whole process is a sham. Thank you for your comments. It's now time for speaker number six, and I'd like speakers 10 through 15 to come to the front row. Speakers 10 through 15, come down to the front row. Hello, my name is Kaima Nelson-Bown, N-E-L-S-O-N hyphen B-O-W-N-E. I live in the town of Franklin. I ask myself, where does my outrage about the proposed NED pipeline and the 30,000 horsepower compressor stations to rebuild in Franklin and Wright start? Not with the fact that the psyche and soul of our region will be scarred forever. Not with the fact that we will receive absolutely no benefit from this scarring, both during its construction and thereafter. Not with the fact that our neighbors and we already are experiencing emotional and mental distress from the proposed pipelines. Not with the fact that tr tremendous damage will be incurred to our fragile roads. Not with the fact that the ga gas will be piped away and sold for profits that do not benefit us. Not with the fact that there are no benefits to us at all. Not with the fact that Kinder Morgan doesn't even have the decency to contact the town of Franklin to discuss the proposed compressor station. Not with the fact that FERC has not yet completed Constitution Pipeline's EIS before beginning a second. My outrage starts with the fact that FERC is now considering a second pipeline just inches away from the first. My outrage starts and ends with you, FERC. You are an independent agency who behaves as if being a pawn of the oil and gas industry. As a regulatory commission, you have an ethical responsibility to the citizens and the environments impacted by your decisions. Governor Cuomo recently had the guts and the wisdom to stand up to these pressures and outlaw hydrofracking in New York State. Please, FERC, throw away your rubber stamps. Complete and a supplemental environmental impact statement for Constitution Pipeline, which includes cumulative impacts like the Northwest Energy Direct, or better yet, say no to NED. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Speaker number seven. My name is Eleanor, E-L-E-A-N-O-R, Moriarty, M-O-R-I-A-R-T-Y, and I'm here tonight representing the Delaware Otsego Audubon Society, the local chapter of the National Audubon Society. The comments I'm presenting here are uh, by our board, by our membership, and they've been authored by Andy Mason, our conservation chair. There is strong evidence against any public need or benefit from this pipeline. FERC should insist on proof that this project is necessary, lacks alternatives, and will provide benefits to the public before giving a privately owned for profit corporation the authority to take citizens' private property against their will. We have major concern about the pipeline's impact on bird habitat. Many of the forest dwelling birds in our region are in significant decline, due in large part to fragmentation of woodlands. These forest-dwelling birds required large tracts of contiguous forest for successful breeding. As these areas are broken into smaller pieces by development, agriculture, and other activities, predators and nest parasites negatively impact nests and lowering breeding succession. A pipeline right away will significantly damage these forest areas, resulting in loss of habitat. The path of the preferred route along the higher elevations of our region will take it through some of the largest and most important unbroken woodlands for birds. 
continued maintenance of the right of way is to keep it clear means a perpetual corridor a threat to the forest birds. It has been suggested that the pipeline right of ways could benefit bird species that often can survive and, and breed successfully through brush and edge habitat. However, there's an abundance of these areas in our area. And as a result, these birds really do have a relatively healthy population in contrast to the steady declining forest species. In our addition to our concern over loss of important bird habitat, the pipeline possesses significant threats to wetlands, streams, vegetation, and other wildlife. There should be full studies and impacts given prime consideration in assessing these projects. These issues were raised during the Constitution pipeline proceedings. They're well known, not just by us, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, among others. However, FERC essentially disregarded them and as they did all environmental concerns for that project. There is a stunning abdication of the responsibility and duties of a public agency. There is little to suggest that FERC's approach to this project will be any different. However, we and others do care about the environment and wildlife, so we continue to participate in this process, knowing full well that this agency will again probably rubber stamp this company's plans and the public be damned. On balance, we do not believe there is any overriding need for this pipeline, and certainly that the environmental damage is unacceptable for such a questionable pipeline project. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Speaker number eight. My name is Linda Bivalacqua. B is a boy, E, V is a victor, I, L, A, C, Q, U, A. Dear FERC, shame on you. Shame on you for wasting our taxpayers' money. Shame on the government of the United States. Shame on you for humiliating well-intentioned people. Shame on you for putting profit before our health and safety. Shame on you for letting corporations take private land by eminent domain from hardworking people, many of whom have had their life savings invested in their paradise. Shame on you for appearing at these circus meetings after you've had a nice meal and a comfortable hotel room funded by us. We are the ones running around, spending gas money, putting miles on our cars, sacrificing our time and families, and our communities are being divided. Shame on you for not listening or caring about us. You'll approve, the, approve this pipeline just like you do all the rest that come before you. FERC, shame on you. Thank you for your comment. Speaker number nine. My name is Heidi Goggins. G is in George. O G I N S. I am a farm owner in Delaware County, and the only reason this pipeline isn't going through my farm is because I'm in the New York City watershed. You want to know about environmental impacts. <laughs> you know, I'm not good at following orders. I mean, what I really want to say is if we lived in a democracy, Kinder Morgan would have to appear before you to prove that there's no harm from this. We shouldn't be here. But since you want to know about environmental impacts, methane is 86 times as potent a greenhouse gas as CO2 over a 20-year period. Scientists have told us that in order to avoid catastrophic climate impacts, we must transition away from fossil fuel as quickly as possible. I don't know what part of this the United States government doesn't understand, except that they're getting paid by the gas corporations not to understand. Building new gas infrastructure at this point in history is criminal. It is, it is stealing the lives of future generations who are going to have to live with the havoc that we are creating when we build these kinds of things. Um, it's unconscionable. There's a sun up in the sky that, that has more power and more energy than we could ever possibly use. And the only reason that we don't have renewable energy everywhere by now is that 20, 30 years ago, when everybody knew that this was coming, the government refused to do anything. And 
it's kind of a crime. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for your comment. Speaker number 10, please come up. Um, you should already have speakers 11 through 15 in the front row, and if speakers 15 through 20 could also come down to the front row, we'd appreciate that. Uh, I want uh, the public and FERC to know that I got here in a plug-in hybrid car from 40 miles away. I'll be going back on gas, but I came on electric. And I got that electric from a solar array that I recently installed on my roof. Um, the uh, <clears throat> reason I bring this up is that transitioning to electric, to renewables, is much, much, can be much quicker than FERC and the industry are willing to admit or recognize. Um, if I were to um, install too many splits in the house for, for heating and induction stove, I, I would be 100% uh, um, electric. Um, so regulators and politicians are still not responding to the reality that increased methane releases from these pipelines and compressor stations lead to more, not less, global warming. FERC is not responding to the very obvious and needed remedy of minimizing conventional hydrocarbon build-out in order to maximize renewable energy and energy efficiency. FERC does not have a mandate to approve every pipeline that comes down the pike. <clears throat> Poisoning people with fossil fuel emissions from these pipelines, compressor stations, and LNG export terminals does not contribute to the public convenience or necessity. Our energy problems are not a shortage of energy, but a tremendous overuse of hydrocarbons. Our, public, our true public convenience and necess necessity can be served by programs that will encourage the build out of vast numbers of energy efficient buildings, building upgrades and renewables. And in fact, for now, we need an overinvestment in renewables so that those who can afford it and have the available space can generate surplus electricity for the rest of us. This would allow the creation of many more small businesses which politicians of both parties claim they love. This build-out of a new kind of in infrastructure will truly benefit the public good. With proper government policy and support, zero net energy buildings and even net positive buildings can be built. Um, and and uh, presently, uh, un energy efficient buildings can be renovated. Our new buildings can be the generators of our energy, not users. Many can transform themselves from buyers to sellers of electricity. We just need proper government policy. Thank you. Before you leave, can you state your name and spell it for the court reporter? Peter Huderberg, last is H-U-D-I B U R G. Thank you. Uh -huh. Number eleven. Uh, my name is Susie Winkler. S U Z Y W I N like Nancy K L E R. I used to think that FERC was broken, but I've come to the realization that I was wrong. I see now that FERC does exactly what it was designed to do, and that's to keep the public locked out of the regulatory process. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was conceived and built as a fortress with impenetrable walls intended to ignore citizens and protect corporations. Your agency has fortified a moat so deep and wide in its circular thinking that the oil and gas industry bankrolls the agency through its permit fees and, continu and is continuously bolstered by the revolving door of industry, elected officials, and its pre presidentially appointed commissioners. As we citizens have become involved 
and forceful in our opposition to individual projects like the Unconstitution Pipeline and FERC's rubber stamp. FERC also evolved with another layer of protection, your tolling orders, intended to block the, pub the public's ability to get into court and be heard. In fact, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals denied Stop the Pipeline's petition for a writ of mandamus, saying that STP did not meet the requirements of mandamus, and I believe that in doing so, the court has enabled FERC's behavior. Though we've learned from our predecessors, it's still taken three years for activists to get up to speed, to witness the life cycle of the system for ourselves, to absorb the process, and to unearth FERC as an independent agency, as an independent agency, solidly under the thumb of the oil and gas industry. But now it's clear as day that the process is fixed. Best thing I can say tonight is that my eyes, our eyes, are finally wide open, that our numbers are growing with every single filthy rubber stamp that you accept, that you approve, every project. Thank you for your comments, and I'm certain you want to let other members of your community also speak, so you must yield the floor to speaker number 12. I believe I have three minutes. Thank you. Speaker number 12, please come up.